Thank you, Paul, for giving, giving me some time out of your day. Um, today, we wanted to go beyond what we did with or to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission a couple of weeks ago when we took them to task. Um, I, I, I used that phrase rather than the, uh, the less polite phrases that we used among ourselves when we right. took them a new uh, something. Conceptually, you'll let me, you'll correct me now, but I'm, I'm a student, you're a teacher. But I'll, I'll correct you. Yeah, readily. and interrupt when I get it wrong because it's still quite hot. Well, let, let's not call them cooling ponds. Uh, there okay. are cooling ponds and there are spent fuel pools. Okay. Maybe I should try to- Please, take over. Uh, uh, take over. Um, a nuclear reactor, the commercial nuclear reactors, I've operated both commercial and the Navy nuclear reactors, but we're only gonna be talking about the commercial nuclear reactors. Uh, typically 12, 15 feet in diameter, maybe 30 feet high and inside of the reactor are uh, thousands of fuel rods or, you know, about three eighths of an inch diameter, maybe 15 feet long and they're in various bundles, uh, maybe two, 300 bundles in the reactor. And so when you first start up a reactor, and fuel is not very radioactive, but uh, after about 18 months to two years after operation, uh, the, you essentially run low on fuel and, and you can't operate efficiently anymore. So they have to put new fuel in uh, back in the reactor. And basically they take the old fuel out of the reactor and transport it underwater to what is called a spent fuel pool. It's about 50 feet deep and it's adjacent to the reactor and the spent fuel, once it's taken from the reactor is deadly. I mean, if, if you were exposed to that spent fuel, you get a fatal dose in a matter of seconds. Mm. So it stays underwater and uh, beginning of nuclear power back in the early sixties at San Onofre, Connecticut, uh, yeah, Yankee Row and Shipping Port. Uh, they just left it there thinking that the government was gonna have a place to take it away. Well, that never materialized. So they kept uh, building more and more nuclear power plants and the peak was in the uh, 1970s, early 1980s. And uh, we started um, generating up to 20, 25% of the electricity in the United States using nuclear power. And, we would take these uh, spent fuel elements out underwater, put them in the spent fuel pool. And then they, the plants, which were originally licensed only for 30 or 40 years, went and got life extension to 60 years. And now they're going for 80 years, but they ran out of uh, space for the spent fuel. The spent fuel pools, which are maybe 50 feet by 50 feet, but you know, a 50 foot cube, uh, had no more physical room in there. So they had to make room so that they could continue to extract the used fuel and put it in the spent fuel pool. So they came up with the dry casks. But when they put it in the dry casks, that fuel had been sitting in the spent fuel pool for anywhere from two to 20 years. Uh, so it wasn't quite as radioactive as the new fuel that came out of the reactor. Now, we've gotten to a point where we are right now that all the operating plants, their spent fuel pools are full of very, very highly radioactive uh, material from the fission products, uh, from the fission process and the products uh, primarily cesium iodide, strontium, so on and so forth. So the majority of the radiation at a nuclear power plant, be it Fukushima or Three Mile Island or any nuclear power plants, the majority of the radioactivity outside of the reactor vessel is in the spent fuel pools. Um, I have, and we have, members of the, you know, 
I want to say knowledgeable people that uh, don't oppose nuclear power, but oppose the way it's regulated, uh, started saying in around 1990 or so, hey, these spent fuel pools, if they, um, they contain a lot of uh, radioactive waste. And what happens if we lose the water? Mm. Uh, we had an event in uh, 19, August 13th of 1994, at Connecticut Yankee here in Connecticut, where we came very close to losing Connecticut, we almost lost the water in the spent fuel pool, which would have been disastrous to the state. This was kept very quiet. I happened to work at the utility that was operating the plant. I'm sorry, it was 1984. Um, so we came close. I mean, if this water is lost that covers the spent fuel. What will happen there is the spent fuel will heat up. There will be a um, zirconium, uh, wa water zirconium reaction that actually cause oxidation and actually cause a spent fuel pool fire, uh, which will spread throughout the entire spent fuel pool, which I said is looking down on the top 30 feet by 30 feet and has, well, like uh, San Onofre, uh, what did I say, 3 million pounds of fuel. Mm. Um, so we came very, became very concerned about it and um, got the NRC's attention. We were primarily dealing, I think at the time, with Seabrook and Maine Yankee and Millstone. And what would happen if this event occurred and we got attention. We got the NRC to do some studies and, and we also got, uh, at, I believe it was Bob Alvarez who was at the time working for Senator Glenn and he's a nuclear PhD. And the NRC and Bob Alvarez did some studies. What would happen if we lost fuel or water in the spent fuel pool? Well, the new fuel that is the hottest, you lost all uh, water and cooling, these things would heat up and they would ignite and they would spread radioactivity uh, over the countryside. Uh, some analysis, I think it's Bob's analysis, that's not inconsistent with the NRC analysis, uh, projects a contaminated area of about 9,000 to 10,000 square miles, which is the size of Pennsylvania or twice the size of Connecticut. And the, the, the shape of that area would be uh, uh, controlled by which way the winds were blowing? Exactly. It would depend total, totally on atmospheric conditions, so the, uh, wind, so the, the risk, inversions. The risk zone would then be a, a great graduated circle in 360 degrees. Yeah, uh, if, if you plot a risk versus degrees on a circle, yeah, the predominant, um, uh, what do they call, a rose petal graph would show, um, you know, the predominant winds is the most probable. But, um, you know, we, we look at that and then we look at what happened at, at Chernobyl and we look at what happened at Fukushima. And everyone agrees that a spent fuel fire, which they did not have either one of those plants that I mentioned. But at the time Fukushima was happening, we thought there was a possibility it was gonna occur. Uh, the contaminated area, I mean, if the wind was blowing the right way, Tokyo you know, would have been permanently contaminated. Uh, we saw Chernobyl where the winds carried it northward around Belarus up to Norway and back down, um, contaminated a lot of land, but the uninhabitable land was only a few hundred square miles around both Fukushima and um, Chernobyl. Chernobyl. Uh, we're talking uninhabitable land from a spent fuel pool fire instead of a few hundred miles like Fukushima and Chernobyl. Uh, over 9,000 miles. Wow. So 
that's why it is a concern. I mean, it is a monumental concern. Uh, we've been pushing, many of us have been pushing, to get that fuel out of the spent fuel pools and put it somewhere else like dry gas and reduce the consequences of an event should it occur. Now, taking it out into like San Onofre, maybe a hundred individual uh, bunches of spent fuel pool, you know, if an event occurs, most likely it's not going to impact all of them at the same time. And it, the fuel is uh, cooler than it is in the spent fuel pools. But it's the most significant potential danger in the commercial nuclear industry is the spent fuel pools, uh, even more so than a reactor meltdown. Well, uh, well, because we're all afraid of the reactor meltdown. That's the one that's pop been popularized in movies in the past, or in a movie in particular, the China Syndrome, um, which came out prophetically three weeks before the Three Mile Island uh, uh, nuclear near disaster, the, the uh, venting of, of gas. But uh, you just said something, and I wanted to, to scope it now. Uh, you said something about light, um, if an event happened, it would be a singular event that it would be to one casket, uh, to one cask or canister, and not to a whole bunch. But San Onofre is different since the event that would cause that one could cause 73 at the same time. So San Onofre is different from the other containment. Yeah, it, it's, it's a little bit different because the fuel of San Onofre, even if you did uh, jeopardize the integrity of 73 canisters, because that fuel is 10 plus years old, it's probably not going to uh, produce a zircaloid fire like the spent fuel would. I got it. Uh, you, we talk about a meltdown, and I was an expert witness uh, in civil litigation uh, after Three Mile Island and studied the releases and, and so on and so forth. And it was a meltdown, by the way, mm -hmm. at Three Mile Island. Um, the releases were significant, but were there any... Uh, immediate fatalities from radiation overexposure? No, statistically, there were probably some fatalities from the gases, xenon and krypton that were emitted during the accident. So they had a meltdown and the consequences weren't real bad. Uh, of course, consequences at Chernobyl and Fukushima uh, where they also had meltdowns or explosions were considerably worse, but even worse than any of the three I just mentioned would be the uh, uh, spent fuel pool fire. Yeah. So how likely do you consider, or what, well, two questions. One, what sort of events might trigger an accident in the spent fuel pools the way they're currently constituted? Okay, there, there's different events, and I certainly can't, cover them all. We had an operational event uh, uh, back at Kinetic Yankee 1984. That was one event. But let me give you some examples of, of what I believe to be the most likely events. Um, the first event, and most likely, I believe, I can't prove it, would be terrorism. If mm. I wanted to do harm, to a large part of this country, terrorism would be the easy way. Uh, some of these spent fuel pools, uh, we always think of a pool that's something in the ground, but on 37 reactors in the lower 48, uh, uh, manufactured by General Electric, exactly like Fukushima, these, the bottom of the spent fuel pools actually uh, 30 feet above the ground. Mm. So it's a suspended fuel. Yes, the walls are two to three, four feet thick, but um, there are readily available 
weapons that could take them out. If we look at the other um, 75 reactors whose pool, spent fuel pool is located on the ground, uh, again, the walls of the spent fuel pool are visible to the outsider. Um, mm. And again, Bob Alvarez has, has done an, some analysis on uh, you know, some type of uh, shoulder mounted missiles and RPGs, uh, rocket propelled grenades and so on and so forth. And you know, that could happen. Uh, we have now pretty sophisticated drones. You mean those, those weapons that we equipped the Taliban with <laughs> years and years ago could come back and bite us on the butt. Well, they already have. They've been using Stinger missiles over in Afghanistan for 20 years against us. Yeah. <laughs> but if they really want to do some more now, um, the pools, you know, are protected on the side, two to three, four feet of concrete, but the top is just a sheet metal roof. Mm. Uh, very vulnerable from the top. You just lob uh, one over. <laughs> well, that we've got some pretty sophisticated drones. We've got, uh, you know, artillery of a state sponsored that from 18 miles can, you know, put a 200 pound explosive within a two foot radius if they want. Mm. Um, okay, so that that that's one thing. Um, the second thing is when they load a dry cast, um, they take this big uh, cask again, I don't know, 10 feet in diameter, 24 feet long, put it into the spent fuel pool and this thing weighs about 80 tons. And they have actually come close to dropping these. Uh, in some cases, if they drop it, it could penetrate the bottom of a spent fuel pool. That's another accident that could cause a meltdown. Um, let's see. The other, of course, is uh, earthquake. Uh, the other thing that we almost got into is in uh, Fukushima, where you have a total sustained loss of power mm. and the spent fuels, pools start to heat up up and evaporate the water and become uncovered. Fortunately, at Fukushima, they were able to um, bring in fire and keep the fuel in the spent fuel pools from melting. Uh, fortunately, they were able to get water only because the top of the spent fuel pool blew off in their explosion. So the fire hoses, uh, ladder trucks could actually project water into the spent fuel pool to keep it um, closed. Had they not been able to do that, we wouldn't have Tokyo today, most likely. Mm. So it's, um, it's dangerous. Um, you know, I have a friend you communicated with, ex-NRC uh, guy, ex-submarine captain, you know, he, he, he and I agree, and many other experts, that the, the, you know, we have three choices right now, geological storage, such as Yucca Mountain, we have dry gas storage, and we got spent fuel pools. And we say, uh, unsafe, less, or we say, say, he's one of my friends says, safe, safest is geological, safe is the dry gas, and the less safe is the spent fuel pool. So he won't, he won't say unsafe, yeah. though. He won't call it unsafe. He won't call it unsafe, but that's okay. Um, I say um, unsafe, unsafer, unsafest. Yes, that's a little <laughs> bit more accurate. And and, it, and I would I would call it unsafe if we could even get it past the political level of of society. That's, right. That is the, the Yucca Mountain, the deep geological storage, you know. Yeah, well, that's just, you know, given your choices, that's probably the safest choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not going to happen anytime soon because nobody wants it in their backyard. That's right. I just got off a Zoom meeting with the NRC and it had to do with Coburn, Massachusetts, and they're talking about, you know, 
getting it, getting a fuel out of Pilgrim, taking it to Mexico or Texas. Mm -hmm. Not going to happen. Mm -hmm. People are dreaming. Yeah. And I uh, sent you, I think I forwarded to you a uh, communication we had after Robert Hunziker, our friend Robert Hunziker, published his article about our assault on the NRC. Someone wrote to us through him asking if we could help them defeat a plan for or an approach to their community in Canada, asking them to approve deep geological storage at their community. And I had to forward this one to you, or in other words, I had to punt because I'm not well. Um, but there we were being asked to ally ourselves against with a group that's against deep geological storage. And I don't know anything about, about the situation. So I had to yeah. defer. Good, good. So thank you, Paul. Okay, you're welcome.